Good evening. My name is Fatin Jarara, and I'm the co-founder of the Palestinian Club at Brooklyn College. And a lot of you may have not known about the Palestinian Club until maybe recently or until this event. And we've actually been around for almost a year now. This is our second semester, and we're really excited to be here. <laughs> it was it was long coming, so you know someone had to do it. So we're really proud of what we've done so far. We have Dr. Norman Finkelstein. <laughs> who's a political scientist and author. He graduated from Binghamton University and earned his PhD in, from Princeton in political science. Um, he's a Brooklyn, uh, former Brooklyn College professor and he was the recent focus of the film American Radical. Um, and he's also authored a recent book called This Time We Went Too Far, and it focuses on the 2008 um, invasion of Gaza. And we have uh, Mr. Loki. <laughs> Loki is a UK-born Iraqi musician, poet, and playwright, well known for his work um, in the UK. He had a single, a very big single in the UK called Long Live Palestine and actually hit the top uh, charts. He it hit number one in hip hop charts in Amazon and iTunes in the UK. And he traveled with the Viva Palestina convoy to Gaza in the summer. And we have uh, Mr. Jody McIntyre. Jody McIntyre is a journalist, and he has a blog called Life on Wheels. You can find it at jodymcintyre.wordpress.com, and he's actually been living in Palestine, uh, particularly in the West Bank, in Gaza, and in East Jerusalem, Jerusalem for the past nine months. So we're just going to give the mic to them for them to talk about their experiences. I'm sure you've all been waiting to hear that. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Loki to the stand. It's a pleasure to be here. Basically today, we are here to discuss not only the massacre they refer to as Operation Cast Lead, but also, and equally as importantly, the Israeli-imposed, Egyptian-enforced, an American-supported siege on the people of Gaza. It has been estimated that the 22-day bombing campaign cost around 1,400 lives in Gaza. But this siege is murdering human beings as we speak, silently. The question is, how many lives has this silent murder cost? When people are left with no choice, but to cement together bombed and smashed bricks in order to rebuild something resembling their home because bricks are not allowed into Gaza, you know there is something very, very wrong with this picture. When there is something in Israeli law entitled the Grandfather Clause, which entitles any human being who can prove they have one Jewish grandparent to Israeli citizenship, yet people whose grandparents great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents are from Jerusalem, do not have any citizenship or any nationality. You know there is something very wrong with this picture. Now, as a person with a British passport and citizenship to a country which is not only responsible for the Balfour Declaration, but is also one of Israel's main killing machine suppliers, I felt it was my duty to visit Gaza and the West Bank in order to understand the human side of this issue. I've been detained by both the Egyptians and the Israelis. And I urge all of you who hold precious US passports to travel to Gaza and see how your taxes have been spent. Go there and see how the bombs which read made in the USA are received. The mighty United States with its estimated 1,000 military bases worldwide from Japan to Turkey to the UAE to Diego Garcia to Egypt, Colombia and so on and so on. The mighty United States with its monopoly on the arms industry did not merely allow Operation Cast Lead to happen, it collaborated in this crime against humanity. 
And whether you acknowledge it or not, the people of Gaza can never and will never forget this fact. This siege or blockade or whatever you want to call it is merely another example on a long list of Israel attempting to play God with people's lives. Why has this siege become an accepted norm in the eyes of the public? Why? Because of the same media outlets who so dutifully counted the exact number of rockets fired from Gaza onto land those Palestinians were themselves driven thro from through murder and pillage. I wonder if those same media outlets prior to Operation Castled ever bothered to count how many tins of beans or pieces of bread were not allowed to reach the hungry bellies of Gaza. Furthermore, did any of those influential media outlets even bother to count how many American-made white phosphorus bombs were dropped on the heads of human beings in Gaza from British-made planes? Our struggle is a struggle for public perception, first and foremost, because there is a, a machine at work that wants you to believe a man with a rocket launcher, no passport and no nationality is more of a threat to humanity than a state which has invaded and occupied every single country it borders with and is armed to the teeth with the most sophisticated killing machines on the face of this planet. These same media outlets want you to believe a man with a beard and a rucksack is a bigger threat to all humani humanity than the killing machines produced by Lockheed and BAE systems every single day. Now, even with the much-hyped quote-unquote dispute which took place between the Obama and Netanyahu administrations, even that dispute was not enough to even pause this abnormally cosy relationship Israel has with American-made killing machines. While Netanyahu was in Washington supposedly being chastised, the Pentagon and Israel were in the process of signing a massive arms deal. But of course that wasn't reported in the mainstream press over here at all. No. It seems for the most honest reporting of Israel's actions, one can only rely on certain voices within the Israeli press. Amos Harel wrote in the newspaper Haaretz on the 30th of March 2010, According to the deal, Israel will purchase three new Hercules C, um, C-130J warplanes. The deal for the three aircrafts designed by Lockheed Martin is worth roughly a quarter billion dollars. Each aircraft costs $70 million. The aircrafts were manufactured specifically for Israeli needs and include a large number of systems produced by Israel's defense industry. This is the important bit coming up next. The deal will be covered by American foreign assistance funds. So not only did they sell them the weapons, they gave them the money to buy the weapons. So while this pantomime of disagreement was being played out for the world's press, the continued relationship of collaboration was still firmly in place. Israel has even bombed Gaza since then on a few separate occasions. Maybe they were testing out their new equipment. America doesn't allocate foreign assistance aid for nothing, and Lockheed do not make weapons of war for nothing. While the world sleeps, the crimes against humanity continue. But why is it deemed accept acceptable for such crimes to be committed on the indigenous people of that important land? Simply because the governments of the UK, USA and Israel, as they have demonstrated time and time again without fail, refuse to recognise anybody's humanity but their own. But what about us? What about the people? What about the human beings? Whose side are we on and where do we stand? Well, there is a line of division on this, but is not a line dividing Jewish and Arab opinion. It is not a line dividing Jewish and Muslim opinion. It is not even a line dividing Israeli and Palestinian opinion. It is a line dividing those who believe in the equality of all and those who believe in the supremacy of some. Now this is our struggle, to bring equality. Nothing more and nothing less. Our struggle is not about the supremacy of anyone or the dehumanization of anyone else. That was Zionism. Our struggle is about the humanization and equality of all. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. And Loki goes by another name, <laughs> Kareem Dennis. Now I'd like to ask uh, Jody McIntyre to come up, please.
without anyone knowing where they were being taken.
I had gone to the occupied territories in <laughs> August 1988, so I began work here right after the Intifada began, and I think there was probably as much agitation here as there was in the West Bank in Gaza on account of my presence. I think I was the headline of the school paper about every other week that I was here. There was a very active Hillel. I called it the Hillel House. After a while, I started to call it the Heil Hillel House, <laughs> or the HHH, and refer to them as the Jewish Citizens Council, for those of you who know the history. Uh, I can't say the memories are all that pleasant. A number of students that remain friends with them, one of them, Abdullah Hassan, uh, he went to teach, went to do journalism in Egypt, and now as we speak, he's at Oxford. And there was other, also a, a young woman named Miriam who became a school teacher, and several, uh, Richard Wright, uh, Patrick Damas, uh, they became lawyers. Camille Goodison, she's a professor now of literature, in Brooklyn, and those are warm memories. I can say the memories of the faculty are very warm. Actually, it was one of my first introductions to politics, and it's one, always as I speak, I recall the story when the department decided it was time to dispose of me I was in the political science department, which was supposedly a radical department. And they wanted the most radical de professor in the radical department and said, are you going to support Finkelstein? And the professor said, I think Finkelstein would be happier somewhere else. And I thought to myself, isn't that a decision I should make? Um, but things have changed. The campus looks different, parts of it. Uh, the beautiful building they built behind the um, field, the track field, that's new. The library is quite nice, for sure. It's beautiful. Uh, the thing that's most changed is you people. <laughs> <laughs> there were no Muslims at Brooklyn College in 1988. None at all. None at all. There are only a very tiny handful of Latinos. You can count them the number of your fingers. Brooklyn College was one-third, one-third, one-third. It was one-third, you call it ethnic white, Irish, and Italian white. They used to hang out at the building in the quad, in front of the building. Um, <laughs> one-third Jewish, mostly yeshiva Jewish. Uh, nothing more need be said, and one-third African-American and Caribbean uh, American. And so this is a new constituency at Brooklyn College, and I'm told they also have now a large Latino population at Brooklyn College, so some things have changed. The biggest thing that's changed is the level of hysteria. When I spoke here, I spoke several times, the audience, it was sheer bedlam, complete bedlam, and people were literally shouting me down, impossible to speak. Brooklyn College was very politically correct. I bet you the same people are still here, Nancy Romer, Bob Cherry, they were all <laughs> very politically correct, but on this issue, it was not to be believed. As some of you know, Brooklyn College's three most famous alumni are Meyer Kahane, uh, Baruch Goldstein, and Alan Dershowitz, uh, which says quite a lot for Brooklyn College. <laughs> uh, but it seems now to be a much more sane, calm, reasonable place. And 
that's something we should think about or we should take to heart. Times have changed and people are becoming, I hope, more reasonable. We have to really create our own lobby at this point to represent all the people that we've been, you know, seeing. When we were in Chicago, uh, it was 800 people. Everywhere where we went in the Midwest, it was between three and 350 people. Uh, there's been, there's a lot of people. There's no war now. It's quite relatively quiet, but there's still a lot of interest. So there are real possibilities if we do things right. And now, I wonder if you can dim the lights a little. No, no, no. It works better. Can you dim the lights just a little? Possible? Palestine 